Story can offer us meaning about who and what we are in a way that is deeper and more meaningful than exacting history. Vermont's most renowned story hunter and gatherer, Jane Beck, is my guest next on Connect. I'm Fran Stoddard. Welcome to Connect. Jane Beck is the founder of the Vermont Folklife Center, which she ran for 24 years. Highly regarded nationally, Beck has been honored with two Governor's Awards, a Peabody Award, a Lifetime Achievement Award from UVM, and an honorary doctorate from Middlebury, among others. She has just published a book about Vermonter Daisy Turner, the daughter of slaves who offers us an important and compelling story for Vermont and this country. Welcome, Jane. It's great to have Thank you here. Thank you, Fran. And what a wonderful book. <laughs> so you actually met Daisy Turner nearly three decades ago and knew she was important. But how did, how did you meet and befriend this, at that, at that time, 100-year-old woman? Well, I was first sent a clipping and by Margaret MacArthur, the singer mm -hmm. and musician. And she told me that she, she had always wanted to go meet Daisy. She had wonderful songs and encouraged me to go see her. And I listened, and I always looked for an introduction, and I couldn't find an introduction to Daisy. And later on, I learned that she had a shotgun, <laughs> and uh, so I wrote her a letter, and then waited a week, called her, no answer. The next time, I called again. I get a ringing, hello, and uh, you know, is this Daisy Turner? Miss Turner, yes. And uh, anyway, uh, then she listened to my spiel for about 10 seconds and then turned the tables on me and said, are you a prejudiced woman? Booming it over the telephone. I couldn't right. believe it was a 100-year-old woman. And, and so I said, uh, I don't think so. She said, come anytime. And mm -hmm. I said, OK, right how about next Thursday? Yeah. Wonderful. Well, I guess she, she wasn't intimidating to some, but she, you know, she was a tough, tough woman. She'd been through a lot. She'd been through a lot. She was amazing. But first and foremost, she was a storyteller, and that was the most significant thing about her, and she mm -hmm. drew you right in. Well, and, and around that, you've written that while memory is, we'll get into her story in a minute, but while memory is unreliable, it is always meaningful. And I certainly believe that. But how do you listen for and distinguish what is meaningful in a story? I, I think memory, so it, it's the emotion in memory. When a memory is often laid down, you still feel the emotion mm -hmm. that you experienced when that memory was laid down. So the Turner narrative is full of what I call touchstone stories, key stories, pivotal moments that are surrounded by emotion. And these are the backbones of the story. So they tell you, you know, how they feel when Alec first discovered he was a slave or Daisy standing up against racism. Right. Um, so we'll, well, let's, let's just, before we, you traveled far and wide to, to research um, this story, but one of them, let's just tell that story. The first touchstone when Alec realizes that he is a slave is quite remarkable. Do you want to just tell that story and, and, and why that's important? Because, well, this is his realization. Well, it was his realization that he wasn't dressed as the other children that he was playing with. The, when under five, the white and the black children played together. And he didn't have shoes, and he only had a smock. And um, so he asked his mother, and she doesn't really answer, but she makes him a pair of red moccasins. And he loves them, and he struts around in them, and then he suddenly realizes she takes them off every time a white person appears. And one day she forgets, and Mistress Golden comes down, sees him, throws the moccasins in the fire. He goes berserk. He's five. He bites her. He scratches her. She falls in a swoon, is carted off. And, but all he remembered was the awful look in his mother's eye. And that was because she was scared he would be sold off the plantation in punishment. Of course. Of course. So speaking of that plantation, when 
you you have done documentaries, a radio series with Barbara Jordan, children's books. Um, why, after you retired, you started researching. You've been to Africa and England and all over Virginia where the plantation, to confirm Daisy's stories. Um, I, I get, I mean, it's, why did you write this book? I mean, this is, well, first of it all, took I, years. <laughs> it, it did, and um, I promised Daisy. Daisy, although she was a storyteller, she realized that nobody would take her story seriously unless it was in book form, mm. and she wanted me to do it right away. <laughs> and I knew I couldn't because I knew that for her story to be taken seriously, it had to be carefully documented culturally and historically. And so when I retired, I suddenly had the time. And I didn't know it would take me quite as long as it did. But <laughs> well, it's quite remarkable. And actually, the story begins with Daisy's African grandfather. Uh, it's an unusual and very dramatic story right from the beginning. Absolutely. It covers four generations and uh, 200 years. So um, it's really an incredible story from Africa to a homestead in Vermont. And we don't have stories like this from an African American's perspective from anywhere, much less Vermont. It's the Turner voice told for the Turner family, and that's why I think it's so important. And uh, another, so it was very clear to Daisy where, where she came from, that she was from the Yoruba tribe. I think she pronounced it differently. Yoruba. Yoruba. Um, so, so go back to that, that so what was her, what was that ancestral story just to, to begin with? So fascinating. Well, to begin with, her uh, great-grandmother was an Englishwoman who went out to Africa in her father's trading vessel on her honeymoon, and her husband was the major trader. And they were in a terrible storm, the ship was wrecked, and her husband was drowned, and she was saved by an African chief son who was a very powerful swimmer. Now, you don't swim on the coast of Benin because the surf is so terrible, mm -hmm. the currents and the sharks. And so this was an important, he was obviously big, strong, strong man. powerful, <laughs> and this comes through in, in the family. And uh, anyway, she had a child by the African chief's son, and he grows up and becomes involved in trading and then in the slave trade and is captured as a, as a slave himself and brought to oh, this so country. The tables turn on him. Yes, and Daisy always said he got too smart for his own good. <laughs> and uh, another interesting thing, so he's sold cheap, right? Because well, he's after, arrogant or... Well, Daisy always said he was sold cheap in New Orleans. He, he comes into New Orleans about 1830 and is sold cheap because he's arrogant and a troublemaker. Later on, I discovered that he was actually probably sold cheap because he was sold illegally, and that was because uh, his ship that he was on, the Phoenix, was captured, and the slaves on board were discovered and put um, under a magistrate. So. He had to be sold illegally. Oh, so they weren't supposed to sell them. So another thing that's so interesting, so much of history is lost. So you have this storyteller who's giving you stories, and you have to confirm them. Um, not only is there that, there's also so this um, powerful um, African um, who is illegally sold into sl slavery, most likely, is also becomes a boxer instead of um, and he's able to make his owner a lot of money, and so you conjecture that the owner is able to buy a lot more land. So there are, and there are other things ar around conjecture about what maybe happened. How do you live with th the guessing and the, the putting together? How do you uh, well, make that work? The conjecture was um, I didn't understand where Golden's money came from. This is the owner. This is this is the, the owner. owner. And so I went back through the generations, and for seven generations they were yeoman farmers. They never owned more than 200 acres of land, and suddenly he's buying 750 acres of prime land right on, on the river. river. And it the timing is is right for when uh, 
Daisy's grandfather first began boxing for him. Hmm. And um, the other thing was that um, in doing the research, I learned that one statement was that there was more money won on boxing matches than on horse races. There was a lot of drinking, a lot of heavy betting. It was tough stuff. And it was looked down upon by the aristocracy the, and the major oh. slave owners. And I discovered that even though he was living next to several uh, aristocratic uh, slave owners, he was never invited there because I found uh, the books of guests. Mm. Oh, and um, he, he was not among their guests. So you must have spent a lot of time in Virginia where you you have photographs of the plantation and that area and maps of, of um, this this place that's that kept growing yes actually um, and, and among other things that you you also learn is that um, Alec uh, a Jamaican is killed during some of the boxing that here. was the last uh, boxing that Alec's father did um, he killed a Jamaican in the ring and then he refused to fight anymore and uh, nothing that Golden could say would make him fight mm. and um, he went to building a, uh, <coughs> excuse me a wheat barn and a rafter fell on him and he was killed mm. uh, so his son who was born a slave um, 1845 <laughs> in 1845 uh, we'll start moving along. Another touchstone for Daisy um, and for Alec is the, the son uh, is escaping and coming back uh, to the plantation. That was his most important story. He escaped uh, with the help of Ferdinand Dayton. The first New Jersey cavalry was encamped on the other side of the river. So the war is, the war is the underway. The war is underway and he escapes. And that night, uh, one of the officers hears Alec and some of his cohorts talking about an outpost of Confederate soldiers on the Golden Plantation. And they decide to take a, a volunteer group of about 20 men back to the plantation to capture this outpost. And Alec helps lead them. Mm -hmm. And um, while that happens, uh, and they're capturing these <clears throat> vedettes. Alec sneaks off half a mile to the overseer's house and shoots him. And mm. this is the way he turns his back on slavery and um, is able to then take part in life again. That's his moment and of freedom. And that is his moment of freedom, but he really stands up for himself. Mm. And that's the most important thing. You know, with, with so much um, in the news about refugees, it really struck me in your book about the massive refugee crisis that the Civil War created. And so here, Alec Turner is a refugee uh, of sorts Absolutely. and trying to make it in the world. And so when he finally does make it to Vermont, he calls his home Journey's End, which is, you know, really gives that refugee story. So quickly, can you take us to his getting to Vermont? He, Hard worker, just... Well, he... Uh, after the war, Dayton, who he had been an orderly for, takes him back to New Jersey. They, uh, he gets him a job, and he goes to two years of night school. Mm -hmm. He comes back to Washington, and through the Freedmen's Bureau, gets a job uh, with A.H. Merrill in Maine, of all places, in a slate quarry and he becomes a foreman there and for five years I found all of the records, the pay mm. records. He is the leading wage earner for five years. Imagine mm. that. Mm. And um, he, during that time he marries and his wife gets very ill. She has three children, boom, boom, mm. boom, or mm. twins and then. And um, she goes down, uh, Merrill takes her down to Boston to Mass General and finds a doctor and her life clings in the balance mm. and Alec has a job at loading freight but is combing the newspapers for a job and discovers one in Vermont with mm. 
Charles White in Grafton, Vermont. And when he looks into it, he finds out that Grafton is a very healthy place. And so he thinks about his sick wife. And, and he brings uh, Sally yeah. up. And um, so, and Alec makes a real impression on his new community. Um, when, when he gets there, you recorded Daisy telling a, a story uh, about her father. Um, do, do we need to set, set, set this up at all? Well, let me set it up first. Uh, the, the Vermonter said, you won't be able to earn enough to put salt in your bread. And Alec is determined to prove them wrong. And he discovers that most Vermonters have a three and a half pound axe. So he has a four pound axe made. And his conduit into Grafton is through the general store. Hmm. And he quickly, uh, people enjoy his singing and his storytelling. Hmm. And uh, he also helps Bill Wyman unload freight. And then one day, uh, he says, well, I'd, I'd love to, to buy 10 pounds of flour and take home to my wife. And Bill Wyman says, well, if you can carry a barrel home without setting it down, I'll give it to you. Okay, let's take a look. Bill Wyman said, if you could carry a barrel of that flour to Sally and the children on the hill, I'll give it to you. Well, Father said you were lost because I'll, I'll pick it up when I go. So father finally got ready and he got started. So he put the barrel of flour and he told me uh, many a time just how to do it, just right on the parallel of his shoulder and started. When he got to the bridge, the first bridge out there, he didn't take it off, but he changed it like that, a little like that, over just a little bit further because he said he found out he knew he had to make the hill and the valve would have to lay a certain way then. So he shifted it then and went on. So so this is 300 pounds instead of because he wanted a little bit, he gets 300 pounds. What, 40 men are following up the hill and he gains the respect of the town. He gains the respect <laughs> of the town. And he also had the respect of the town fa fathers. Mm. And that really, I think, protected him from a lot of racism. Uh, they had been engaged in the underground, um, they were all abolitionists, and here was an ex-slave coming mm. to Grafton, and they wanted to help him. So did, did the Turner family experience much racism there? They all say they did not. Um, right down to the grandchildren, oh. they, they said they did not experience it until uh, they moved away down to Boston, the Boston area. So um, <laughs> back to, back to, to Daisy, a t another touchstone for her, because here she is, she's um, these wonderful photographs of, of her in school. Uh, there is one just incredible story of her uh, where the teacher gives her a black doll to, to do a story about Africa. Everybody gets a different, what, country to talk about, and she's rather upset about this. Very upset, and uh, she's eight, and she doesn't want to do it. And she goes home, and her father persuades her to do it. And uh, so she goes to school, and um, day of the occasion, her best friend goes out, and her, all of her friends are going out, and she's wearing an old dress, and she's um, last in the program. And so she tells the teacher she's not going out. She's mad. She's mad. Okay, let's see Daisy telling the story. And with the doll at home, my white doll and my white dress and everything, I could have been the best. Instead of that, there I was. The old school dress they all had seen, my hair braided instead of being fluffed and everything. And I was angry, so my voice was high. And I said, you needn't crowd me, you needn't crowd my dolly out, although she's black as night. And if she is at the foot of this show, I think she'll stand as good a chance as the dollies that are white. My daddy says that half the world was nearly dark as night, and it took no harm to take a chance and to stay right in the fight. So stand up, dolly. <laughs> so sit up, dolly, and look straight to the judges at the right. 
while I was, and I'll stand right by your side if I do look afraid. And so I went on saying my piece through. But instead of saying the piece that the teacher had taught me to say, I was saying what I wanted to say on my own. If we all had that kind of energy <laughs> right now, she's at least she's 100 or 101 when she's telling that story. She's 101 right? when she's telling that story. She wins the first prize, and right. this becomes her major touchstone story. This is the first time she stands up to racism, and she, she does it a number of other times as sure, well. Sure, sure. And, and the first time maybe she recognizes that there's something different as, as an eight-year-old. As eight Absolutely, yes. What, what, does, um, what happened to her, her family? If, if everything was really okay, there, there's still so few African-American families that, that really settled and stayed here. And even her, she had what, 12 brothers and sisters. Yes, yes. So um, are they still around? A lot of the sisters went down to the Boston area to find work, and a number of them married down there, and, and a few stayed, some came back. And she also worked in Boston for and quite she, some time. And she wa worked in Boston until her mother died, and then she came back to keep the house open because all the grandchildren always came up from Boston, from wherever, to stay mm -hmm. on Turner Hill. And um, the families that stayed in Vermont inter intermarried with Vermonters, and now the family is white. Is white. Huh. Her mode of storytelling is, is so uh, beautiful and amazing. Is, is there, do you see the connection between that and West African story? Ab absolutely. Yeah. She's very much in the tradition of the West African griot. Hmm. And um, she learned at the feet of her father, who in turn learned from his father. And the African griot, he was a man of knowledge. Uh, he was genealogist, historian, storyteller, and singer of the community, and that's what Daisy, the role Daisy served in her family. Hmm. Wonderful. Um, you know, there's a recent outdoor journal program that, that happened on the, on the Turner homestead. Uh, so that land no longer belongs to the Turner family. Um, it was turned over. What, what, give, give us a little, a little setup and we'll, and we'll see what it looks like. It, it was turned over to the, or the Nature Conservancy mm -hmm. got it. And then um, Giovanna Peebles, a state archaeologist, mm -hmm. uh, they were going to tear down uh, Birchdale Camp, which mm -hmm. was the only building left. And she got Paul Brune and the Preservation Trust interested, and they have restored uh, or are working on restoring Birchdale Camp. And I think they are going to preserve five acres of Turner Hill where the buildings were. Great. Well, just look at a, a, few, a few seconds of this show. Turner Hill not only features a rich diversity of wildlife and habitats, it's also rich in history. Alex Turner and his wife Sally were escaped slaves who settled in Grafton after the Civil War. On the property, we have not only the foundations that were the Turner family house where he raised his children, but we have actually a house that's still standing where his children live. We've been excited to partner with the Vermont Preservation Trust and the State Historic Preservation Office in order to find a way to see that house permanently protected and restored. It's such a good story because this was difficult land. And, uh, you know, Daisy also talks about how Alec figured out how to work this land that's unusual, so they wanted to keep it for that unusual, um, really, plant life. But fortunately, um, people came in to save the house as well, and that, and that historic piece. Uh, yeah, where, where do you find it? And, and the interesting thing was when they uh, sent photographs of the house, they said it was a Piedmont house, so you know that Alec was involved in um, designing. So the Piedmont, meaning Virginia yeah, style, yeah, oh, Virginia yeah, style, yeah. wonderful. So let's. So what drew you to f to folklore and this unique approach to history? I think, um, you know, which saved this house, where I, I think, as you say, people are the most important. Talk to us just a little bit about folklore and what's so important about this aspect of history or telling a human story. Well, what folklorists do is they concentrate on people and people's stories and the community and um, families. And it's their 
experiences, their practices, um, and it's, it's a focus on, you know, storytelling, what makes people tick. And um, I was drawn to Daisy. I couldn't believe what a marvelous storyteller she was. And the scope of her story was so unusual. That was what drew me to Daisy. And so you recognize how great she is. And, and what I had first, my job at that point was with the Arts Council, and I was to bring the traditional arts to a general public. And at that point in 1983, there were several articles about Vermont being the whitest state in the Union. And I thought, hmm, here's it. somebody that was born here that can really tell us. Singer, storyteller, and we're going to see her as we go out. Jane Beck, thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you for joining us. Vermont PBS would like you to connect with you and keep the conversation going. You can always reach out with feedback and ideas at connect at vermontpbs.org. You can also check out other episodes and extra material with Jane Beck and others at vpt.org. See you next time. My father and them gave these little concerts, and my father and Uncle Early and them would all stand, and at the very last, on nothing on Sunday but half past 11, father would get up with his beautiful tenor and start singing. It is half past 11 o'clock. Don't you hear the watchman's cry? While weeping and sleeping, we'll bid you all good night. Good night, good night, good night, kind friends. We'll bid you all good night.